in the last topic, I introduced this idea of medieval versus Renaissance. And I was trying to make the point that these were not words that they would have used, and rather words that we use to talk about people in Europe from roughly five or 800 to roughly 1500. Because we made up those words and we're using those words ourselves doesn't mean, however, that they're meaningless, that they're just something we're throwing on. And in fact, I think when we talk about the idea of time, that we can really see a difference between the medieval world and the Renaissance world. And here's what I'd like to argue to you, both in words and pictures. And that is, in the medieval world, as we saw in the very last topic, that people's eyes were trained on the timeless. They were thinking about their relation inside of time to what was happening outside of time in heaven. So if you think about it in terms of where they were looking, they were always looking up and they were looking out, up to heaven, into the, uh, the, the perfection outside of time. And one thing that happens very clearly, I believe, in the Renaissance is a move from looking up and out to a move to looking down, looking down at each other, looking at human beings in a different way, looking at nature in a different way. And because of that, it seems to me that the Renaissance understands and experiences time in a different way because its focus is inside of time and what life is like here on Earth more than focusing on outside of time and what might, might be life in the afterlife. Remember when we were looking at the first set of pictures on the medieval world, we started out by taking a look at a Gothic arch with a point on it. And that drew our eyes upwards and it made for a much higher, taller building. What this is, is a picture of a Renaissance arch, or what might be called a Romanesque arch, because this is a, an arch that had been used way before the Gothic period and would be used again later. And here we see a, a much more typical Renaissance arch that is rounded at the top. And you can even see it in the kind of relationship of B to G and I on this picture that we have a round arch that brings our eyes back down towards Earth. So a Renaissance arch tends to be lower, and it tends to make us think more about and look more at things that are lower, not so much in heaven, but more around us on Earth. Here's a picture of two galleries in a Renaissance villa that is inside the Vatican in Rome. And you can really see that here, right? You can see this one after another of Renaissance arches as you're uh, standing in the, in the, uh, the the palazzo in the, or the piazza in the middle of it, right? Even in a very simple home in Rome, you can see the same thing. Here's another Renaissance arch in a Renaissance building that has these pretty geraniums or something outside of it. This is just a regular person's home, but they're living inside of a Renaissance building. And so it has those rounded arches that remind us and bring our eyes somewhat back down to earth. We also see it very much in the art of the Renaissance. And if you think about the Renaissance, and when I ask my students about the Renaissance, they immediately know the names of the artists, right? Because they used to be Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So you know Raphael, and you know Michelangelo, and you know Donatello. Why? Because these are famous artists. And in fact, what happens in the Renaissance is a new cult of the artist in which artists become important themselves. And they become important themselves, I believe, because they're trying to show us their vision inside of time of how the world works. So here's a picture that Leonardo da Vinci did of Mary and St. John the Baptist and Jesus and St. Anne, I guess. And in this picture, even though it's a picture from history, it's a picture from religion, da Vinci is trying to show us exactly how the scene might have played out. You'll notice that the little boys here don't look at all as if they were from the Middle East. They look like pudgy little blonde Northern European boys, or at least Northern Italian boys. And da Vinci's doing this on purpose, right? Because he says, I want you to think about a Bible story as if it were your own neighbor, as if it were here, the way we see things in time. He does more than that though, too. He goes on and he says, look, when we look at things, they are geometrically appropriate. In nature, things happen in geometrical ways. 
So if you're going to be holding a baby on your lap, you might spread your legs a little bit so you have a good, strong base. And so a picture should look that way too. You remember back on the medieval pictures that we looked at in the last topic, and nothing seemed quite natural. Of course, they wouldn't, didn't want to show us nature. They wanted to show us heaven. Da Vinci, Da Vinci wants to show us nature, the way a Bible story would be in what he thought of as real life. So what that does then is it introduces the idea of single point perspective. It's a term we all know. You've heard it in art class, you've seen it around. And all that means is a picture made as if it were done at a certain time and a certain place. So if we look now at da Vinci's very famous and gorgeous and nearly perfect Last Supper, we can see what we mean. Here is a picture of the Last Supper as da Vinci was imagining it if it were in Italy of da Vinci's time. If you look out the back, right, those are not the hills of Jerusalem. Those are the hills of Tuscany that you see. If you look at the table and you look at the men around the table, those are pictures of people pretty much that you might see walking around the streets, right, of Rome or of Florence or of Pisa or wherever. They don't look very Middle Eastern. They look rather Italian. Why? Because he wants us to think about this happening in our time and in our place. Even more importantly, he makes this picture almost as if he was imagining what a photograph would be like. Didn't know what a photograph was, of course, but he's imagining it as a photograph. Think, for example, if he would have painted this picture a moment later. Christ's hands would be different. Each person would be standing in a different way. Or if he had painted this picture as if uh, the painter was standing off on one side or another, then those pictures would be very different. But no, this picture could only happen at this moment in time, at this place in space, as if the painter were there looking at it straight on. You can very much see that here. Right? Here is this absolutely perfect idea of perspective. We are looking at the Last Supper in the way that da Vinci believed it would have really looked, the way nature really looks, where you see things at one point at one time. So it has meaning because Christ is in the center of it. He is the, the center of that perspective. That has good theological meaning, but it also is the way that nature really looks to us. That's what da Vinci is trying to do. Compare it to this, or rather contrast it to this, a very different way of looking at the exact same theological idea or the exact same event. In this case, in the old medieval one, this is an iconographic portrait that wants us to imagine the Last Supper outside of time, in a timeless place where perspective doesn't matter anymore. If we go back to da Vinci, it's almost like a photograph that we're there, right there, at that moment. So da Vinci is a Renaissance man because he wants to focus us on the things that happen inside of time, inside of nature. Sure, he says, I know that heaven exists. Sure, he says, sure, God exists and God is timeless. But for him, the important thing is to focus on what's inside rather than what's outside of time. 